Um, well, thank you to the audience who has come away from coffee time. Uh, that, that's really good. Um, this session is entitled Social Movements, Their Role in Advocating to Reduce the Negative Health Effects of Climate Change. And we've got a wonderful panel here of people, all of whom have been activists in different ways, in different countries, in different parts of the world. What we're hoping to do is after each speaker, we're hoping to have just one question to that speaker and then move on to the next speaker. So it'll be whoever gets up to the microphones first and I'll, I'll have to repeat that. And really what we're doing in this session is saying, well, what is the overlap between climate activism and health activism and how do they fit together? And how do those movements for social change move us towards a world that's within safe planetary boundaries for, for human life? And I'm not going to say any more because I want to give as much time as possible to our panelists. I'll introduce them as they speak, other than to say, first of all, that Bridget Lloyd, co we co-organized this session, and Bridget will be doing a summary of the session at, at the end. So our first speaker is Dr. Erica Otaiga from uh, the PHM, she's very active on the People's Health Movement Ecosystem and Health Circle and is the coordinator of that circle. And she's also a professor at the University of San Francisco de Quito. So over to you, Erica. Hi. Uh, thank you, Fran. Uh, so what I want to talk a little bit, it's also to focus on the conference title, A New Health Agenda. Do we need a new health agenda? So if everybody here was in the launch of the video, we, we saw a very nice boy trying to save the world, and these would be the people that are in the fifth floor. You can recognize their Elon Musk, Bill Gates, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Um, this is just a reparations painting. This was painted in the Rockefeller Center Foundation by Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera is a famous Mexican painter. He's actually Frida Kahlo's husband. And it was demolished because, as you can see in the, in the, over here, this is the struggle between the, in that time, 1930s, the workers' rights and the, the future and the elites. And it was demolished because uh, when they tell uh, uh, Diego to turn it down, to turn it down a, a notch, to not be so radical, he then painted Lenin's face in the mural. So what this has to do with health? Are we talking about social services, universal healthcare coverage, health promotion and prevention, but we're talking about that in these territories. We in Ecuador have a more than 30 year old uh, Chevron Texaco lawsuit, and this is a map of my country, but if you can see, it's not divided administratively, but divided by oil blocks. So which oil block is which, and um, there, there's no need to say more about the dire effects of oil um, splits in people's health. But no fossil fuels is not enough. Now that we are talking about climate change, we have, again, people in the same territories, more displaced by giant mines or displaced by the wood, acquisition of wood for eolic energy. So what does the people health movement do? We, we build solidarity and we build north-south solidarity. Uh, this is just an example of how PHM Canada had also helped Ecuador give a voice in the, the transnational resistance to Canadian mining. You can see there the principal companies in my country, now that you are just transitioned, they are not only oil companies, these are mining companies and main capitals from Australia, Canada, and you can see also Chile there. Chile has a progressive government, so being progressive government is not enough. It's not necessarily anti-extractivist. And we have the people in the fifth floor having a lot of um, incidents in what's happening, right? When the IMF says that clean energy ne needs may cause years of high prices for copper, nickel, cobalt, lithium, what I, can, what I can read immediately is that my country is going to be affected and extracted and devastated, not no, now, not by fossil companies only, but also by mining companies and capital's interests. But then, what have we 
been talking about like a lot of years. This is only um, a translation from modes of living, so we need to start living differently. It's not only a matter of solutions, no fossil fuels or carbon, carbon taxes or not partial solutions, but this is from Luis Maldonado Ruiz, 2009, the School of Government of Peoples and Nationalities from Ecuador. You can learn and read there the difference between capitalism and Quichua Suma Causae. Now, I want to say this is not a new thing, or this is only the translation in words of what the peoples have been living 500 years of colonial resistance, and to translate this knowledge, which is more oral knowledge, into written knowledge. And it's kind of a translation for you guys to understand what we're talking about. And that's not only a philosophical point of view, but also it has things done in practice. So what we have now is, as many of the speakers of the WHO and everywhere have been saying, uh, during COVID, uh, peoples and nationalities had their own remedies, their own access to health, to another health system that's not necessarily the health system of uh, health posts and hospitals and uh, top uh, technical quality. And we are also promoting the um, a traditional birth attendance school. So promoting the rescuing of uh, knowledge. This is actually a book written by one of the traditional birth attendants. And it's a very nice book of poetry in Spanish and in Quechua. And poetry is also then also help and the part of the recovering of knowledge. This is the traditional birth attendant school, and if you see this is kind of putting health in a whole new frame, like poof, your brain explodes because you don't see there a hospital, technology or everything, you see there mountain, a lake called Cuicocha. When you enter the lake, you ask for permission, ask for permission to the lake to be there, ask for permission to the spirits to be there, but also each plant and everything that I, as, an, as a mestizo western-minded uh, um, person thought it was wheat or it was food for rabbits. No, every single thing has a use. So this one for shampoo for your hair, the other one for when your tummy hurts. And um, this is what um, Echeverria, a famous philosopher from Ecuador said. He said that um, uh, indigenous, but I'm going to extend that to traditional birth attendants, contribute is a resistance to modernity, Echeverria said. Modernity as a civilizing tendency endowed with a new unitary principle of coherence or structuring for civilized social life and for the world corresponding to that life. And what I've heard all the, all the, all, in all the panels uh, as solutions is things that are based on the modernity and of, on, in, in this unified way of living. So what we are, when we think about solutions in the green, uh, to the green catastrophe, we said, okay, we need everybody to have the same, everybody the same standard of living to reduce inequity and everything. And we do think that inequity sucks, but this is a more diverse world and a more diverse than one reality, which is probably the Western reality. The resistance of the indigenous people is based on the ability to approach nature in sacred and not purely profane mathematized terms. But this means also a different philosophical approach. This is not only a folkloric, very nice to see the dances thing. Um, Latin America then produces epistemology. It produces thoughts and practice and mobilizations. Here you have a feminist school now uh, being held by Mujeres Creando with Rita Segato, and it's an exchange of feminist women from the communities to cities uh, uh, across the region. And one of the books, Feminismo Bastardo, who is based on not only anti-capitalist struggle, but also anti-patriarchal struggle and anti-colonial struggle. This is a iconic figure of Ecuador, Mama Dolores Cacuango. She fought and she said, uh, for indigenous peoples, we are like the straw of the moor that is uprooted and grows again. And for moor straw, we will sow the wood, the world. And then there you have other epistemologies. I'm sure you have heard that health is living without humiliation. That's what Zapatista movement says in Mexico. So when you told me planetary health and new health agenda, I said planetary health, that's a new. We have been telling this for centuries. The only thing is that you now find a new term that put into words what we have been trying to tell you. And um, 
So this is what international solidarity looks like. This is from the People Summit for Climate Justice, and we had a lot of people from Global North, Global South, bearing and holding a space to hear devasta devastating stories, bro broken ourselves, our hearts again, but then to think, seeing the devastation, what the solutions are, and the solution is not one, the solutions were multiple. You can say, see there, La Selva es Viva. And there was no Noemi Walinga from the Sarayaku people from Ecuador. So, sorry, we are not trying to change each floor one at a time. We are building a new present. We are unbuilding the first floor, the second floor, the second floor, the fourth floor, and the third floor, and we are currently under construction. There are mobilizations in Colombia. That woman is in Ecuador. We had indigenous resistance, a mobilization with an agenda saying, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, go out of my country. Go out of my country. And that has everything to do with health. And now we have uh, what's happening in Peru. In Peru, more than 50 deaths, and they are still struggling. One month, and indigenous people took Lima recently. So that's what we can have from Latin America. To finish, Hope was not alone. Hope in the video was a little boy. He's not alone. He's not alone, even in Thailand's children's imagination. Have you seen the exposition of paintings? So see how in Poon Yisa Tsotsal from Thailand, I don't know if she's a girl or a boy, but from 9 to 13 years, her mind, it's a collective, and everybody is involved in change. I wanted to portray Poon Yisa Tsotsal painting because I started with Diego Rivera, and Diego Rivera is a famous Mexican artist, I'm sure, this girl will make a change, but not alone, in a collective fashion. I just wanted to use 30 seconds to say this, as I said, um, Latin America was promoting new epistemologies and new theories. This is a fragment of Maria Galindo's Feminismo Bastardo. And this is revolutionary. Somebody are not gonna like it. She said, we don't want rights. We don't want, revol we want revolution, we do not want Crumbs, we want revolution. She said, I see some problems in this revolution that we want. We are still heirs to the Marxist-Leninist concept of revolution. It presents the revolution to you as something distant, unattainable. The revolution as the heroic act of killing the enemy to take over the state in the name of a third party. We have to be able to revise, rethink, wash, die, weave, cook, cook another revolution, another way of understanding the revolution. Between the resigning ourselves to neoliberal blackmail and not succumbing to an archaic, outdated, heroic, patriarchal concept of the revolution, we have the challenge of building, of conceiving our own revolution from another vision. Thank you. Cap Kurika. That was fantastic, Erica, and I really like the way you link back to our opening film. And it would be great if the ending of that film could be edited to be collective, as you say. So maybe PMAC can do that. Now, we could, I'd like to have, if somebody want, we could have one question for Erica, if anybody's got it. I just wanted to give that opportunity. But no, it looks like we're okay. Well, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Maria Kolesnikova from, she's the director of Move Green, which is an NGO in Kyrgyzstan, which is concerned with air pollution and other envi environmental issues. So over to you, Maria. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a privilege, actually, to share uh, what activists can do and achieve in our region, which I belong to. It's Central Asia, and they come from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and I will be talking today about air pollution. So this is Bishkek city, our capital. One and a half million people living here. And it's December 2022. A temperature can go down up to 20 degrees Celsius in winter. So it's very cold and people have to heat their homes. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, Kyrgyzstan is a post-Soviet country. We have been independent for 30 years now. We are approximately uh, 6 million, maybe more, people living. And we've been independent for 30 years now. Our country is blessed with beautiful nature, as you can see. However, we have inherited not only amazing mountains, but we also have built our own from waste. 
This landfill is located um, in Bishkek, close to a couple of residential areas, so people really live there. Uh, this is so-called mountain, is 22 meters high and it burns all year round because simply we don't recycle. However, a burning landfill is not a main uh, air pollution source in the heating season and this is not even a power plant operating on coal in our city. The main source appeared to be the heating of private, in most cases not isolated houses around Bishkek with coal, old cut car tires, plastic, other waste, because people come to the capital seeking a better life. We spent almost three years to come up with this conclusion. By saying we, I don't mean, unfortunately, our government or our Ministry of Natural Resources or our mayor's office. I'm speaking about our green movement. Because it was a challenge, and the government and authorities, they challenged us when we started our activism. So this is the first silent strike where we demanded our right to clean air in 19, 2019. Back in 2017, we installed the first devices to find out what air we breathe and if it was safe for our health. We did that because we had neither real-time air quality data nor analytics or any information in the media. And I myself, I was a volunteer and I didn't have environmental background or health background, nothing like that. So why did we care? Because we could see the problem earlier, much earlier. This picture was taken from the mountains near Bishkek in 2014 and I first saw it in 2016. That's how my activism started. And when we installed the sensors, when we got the first data, we kind of like stopped and thought what we should do with this data, how we can effect change with the data. So we decided to share with the general public, but in a clear way, so that they understand the health effects of air pollution. So we shared it with our communities by developing a mobile application. We went viral and local media supported us, so this is one of the articles. Um, because before the campaign there was nothing about air quality or air pollution because it was stereotypically uh, said that we have mountains, a lot of trees, the nature, and we can't have smoke. So it was not possible, like in mines, it was not possible. We even had to do uh, this experiment, which is one of the many examples with four cotton fabric banners with the hashtag Bishkek Air to see if they get black. Uh, and more people, especially decision makers, could see the problem of air pollution in our capital. This is how we gained our first attention from the authorities. Not a positive one, though. Eco-activists were accused of disseminated, drawn, exaggerated air pollution data in Bishkek. And uh, literally, the... Uh, protection, environmental protection agency, they said in the media that we were wrong, so someone should check us, and so it's not like no one should trust to move green, to the green movement. But eventually, within the growing voluntary monitoring network and our awareness raising campaign, we were invited to the table, and together with the prime minister, with the minister of natural resources, the mayor's office, we developed the plan to improve air quality in Bishkek, and that happened in 2019, uh, and the plan meant to be meant to work until 2023. That was the first air pollution acknowledgement, official acknowledgement by the government, and they seemed to take a lead to solve it. This is how our adventure of fighting for clean air, our house and our lives began and still going on in 2023. So has the government been successful so far? Not really. For the last five weeks, for example, Bishkek ranked first in air quality rating among 160 other countries and cities in the world. So you can see Bishkek is on the top, we're the first, but not the thing that we would love to be the first. Moreover, we still have challenges. It's uh, my five years in this activism. Uh, and again and again, due to rabid authorities and decision makers change, um, the turnovers that we have had in last 20 years, our data and expertise has been challenged. So this is another uh, news bulletin saying, like, just happened in December last year, 
And again, the Ministry of Natural Resources want to check us, want to see whether the data is uh, no, like not wrong, right? We are beaten, but still optimistic and energetic. And if you ask me what gives us hope, I will tell you. People, our community, uh, the shared values, uh, so that we continue our work on awareness raising, advocacy, research, policy and education of young people, also demonstrating the renewable solutions, working with energy efficiency, uh, organizing urban talks with policymakers, educating them, and going to strikes also. Uh, and also our achievements, right? For example, I would like to tell you uh, some of our achievements. New Year fireworks were canceled due to air pollution in 2022. And this is not, um, it's um, an exception because in this, this December, this year, it uh, never happened. Um, so what happened? We posted in social media the cards for Instagram, why? because of the temperature inversions, because of the heavy pollution and smoke, we shouldn't add the pollution. And we shouldn't spend money for that. And we have alternatives with lights, with the, you know, all the stuff that with technology. And just in three days after our publication and support from our followers and citizens, mayor's office canceled the um, fireworks and spent those money on other things. So that was one of the win. And also what we do, uh, we have, uh, had a couple of interventions, so 300 trees were freed from asphalt our, uh, after our intervention. How we did that, we made a video, posted in social media, asked influencers and our followers to tag mayor's office and to show them what they should do. So you can see on, um, on this picture um, how it was and how it then turned to, to change. And also we thought that it would be really great to have the uh, Central Asian or regional cooperation and some pressure on our country. So we established the platform uh, with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Members are representatives of state bodies, of influencers, researchers, academia, and activists. And we are working on awareness raising, on policy, um, on etc. So we are engaging more and more people in our movement, we are building up our expertise by inviting academia and researchers. We involve our community members to demonstrate their commitment to changing their behavior to improve the environmental situation. We also work on policy level and other. That's how our power grows and that's how we inspire each other every day and try not to lose our hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maria. I think you've, it was like a sort of an expert class in how you do movement building from working with providing the information and then moments of activism and getting on the policy table. Is there one question for Maria? Can, or? No? Okay, well, we'll move on. Our next speaker is Paul Laris, who's from Adelaide in Australia. He is the People's Health Movement Southeast Asian and Pacific Coordinator. And as he'll tell you, he's also been an activist with Extinction Rebellion that, of course, was uh, described by uh, Rita in the earlier session in this room. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Fran. And thank you to the previous panelists for some excellent presentations. We're here to address the, the negative impacts of climate change and how social movements can change them. This slide shows that uh, some of the, the obvious negative effects, but climate change and health are not only causally interlinked, they also share many social, political, and commercial determinants. The WHO has estimated that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year, just from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. As well as direct health impacts, climate change can cause damage to health service infrastructure and wider health system organisation, reducing health care reach and effectiveness at those times when it's so crucially needed. One of the negative impacts of health on health comes not just from climate change itself, but from its main cause, which is the burning of fossil fuels. Indeed, while social movements contribute significantly to adaptation to climate change, 
their key role now is to advocate for radically reducing the production and burning of fossil fuels. Pollution from power plants, vehicles and other sources accounted for one in five of all deaths in 2018, according to research from UCL and Harvard. Countries with the most prodigious consumption of fossil fuels to power factories, homes and vehicles are suffering the highest death tolls, with the study finding nearly a third of deaths in Eastern Asia, including China, were caused by the resulting fine particle pollution. The global death toll exceeds the combined total of people who die globally each year from smoking tobacco plus those who die of malaria. Furthermore, the negative effects are distributed extremely inequitably, with the most severe impacts on poorer people and poorer nations, and of course, and so unjustly, on those populations who have contributed the least to the emissions. These impacts will also have a divisive effect on social cohesion, with high-income countries having enjoyed the benefits of a fossil fuel growth, while the global south suffers more of the disastrous climatic impacts. Similarly, older people have benefited, while younger people seem left to suffer what looks like an increasingly ominous future. Colonizers have prospered, and indigenous people continue to be excluded and suffer from the extracted, extractive capitalism, which is fueling the climate crisis. So I believe there are at least four major changes to achieving change, four changes that, that social movements need to address. Firstly, this is a global issue. Getting change in one or two countries via political advocacy and policy change will simply not be adequate. Carbon pollution knows no national boundaries. Global action requires strong global organisations at a time when some of the most obvious ones, like the WHO and the UN, a wilting under strong criticism or co-option via public-private multi-state partnerships. Secondly, opportunities for achieving change through traditional advocacy process and political change are hampered by the dominance of transnational fossil fuel corporations in national political processes. This is state capture. For health and climate advocates, the obvious change targets become the fossil fuel transnational corporations themselves rather than national governments. But these TNCs are immensely wealthy and politically and culturally powerful. And they're motivated by markets rather than any democratic processes or consideration of any long-term political good. Climate change is driven by the actions of the rich, but its impact is inflicted on the poor. Oxfam reports that over the last 25 years, the carbon impact of the top 1% of the wealthiest human beings was twice that of the bottom 50%. So in order to reduce harm, the wealthy who are least impacted must be convinced or compelled to make the greatest change. And finally, there is so little time. The windows for change to reduce global heating and its effects to a level where the negative impacts will be at least manageable is rapidly closing. Some claim it's already too late. Strategies must be rapidly effective if they're to be at all useful. So what can social movements offer? Social change comes about when there's mass support. Increasing public awareness of the likely and already experienced impacts of climate change is creating a potential groundswell of popular support for real change. The People's Climate Vote a 2021 survey conducted by the UNDP was the world's biggest ever survey of public opinion on climate change. It covered 50 countries and over half the world's population, including half a million people under the age of 18. 64% of, pe of people believe climate change is a global emergency. The researchers con concluded there's a broad-based appetite for policy action, but there needs to be more outreach to explain how some of the policies address the issue, and more importantly, how they benefit citizens. Responding to this threat is going to require widespread social support, and social movements will be central to this. Social movements specifically targeting the climate emergency include Extinction Rebellion, Stop Oil, st School Strikes for Climate Change, Fridays for the Future, Climate Justice Now, and many, many others. Most civil society organisations with broad objectives for environmental protection, such as Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth and the World Wildlife Fund, also campaign specifically on the climate emergency and the urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. The shared of objectives of health and action on climate change already come together in a range of climate and health civil society organisations, such as the Global Climate and Health Alliance. So 
how do we target this change? And I think one of the one of the lessons that's emerging now is these corporations work through markets, and through markets is a way to attack them. Consumer boycotts can be used against banks which fund fossil fuel projects. The divestment movement focuses on superannuation and pension funds. Shareholders' meetings encourage companies to change their ways or see their share values fall. Corporate donations to politicians can be exposed and should be. The risk of stranded assets can be highlighted. Insurers are made aware of public liability issues. Pressure is built on government decisions about extraction permits. Lawsuits highlight the environmental and health impacts of transport, refinement and emissions. There is a crucial battle for the public perception of the fossil fuel industry. The industry spends billions in greenwashing its image, aiming to portray themselves as on the environment side while they continue their profitable destruction. As Rebecca Solnit points out, it's harder to recognize a false friend than an honest enemy with their false solutions, delaying tactics, and empty promises. One response to this is culture jamming fossil fuel propaganda, as this example from Australia shows. The key question is how to build the awareness that's already there into mass support effectively and to do it quickly. The history of health promotion tells us how not to use health arguments. Alarmist rhetoric does not help. People turn off or dismiss highlighting the ex existential threat as overblown and implausible. There's a natural aversion to facing an intractable problem and an un unpalatable reality. You don't mess, you don't <laughs> build mass support by explaining how threatening and difficult the problem is. Some social movements have tried confrontation and alarmist rhetoric, but with mixed success. And it's notable that Extinction Rebellion in the UK have acknowledged the risk of alienating the public with disruptive action. In a statement last month, they stated, we now prioritise attendance over arrest and relationships over roadblocks. Scientific evidence and rational evaluation are important. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient to produce change. People base their attitudes on emotions as much if not war, more, as on evidence, and on emblematic stories. And social movements and social media are very good at telling emblematic stories. One story that's becoming impossible to ignore is the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather events and their consequences. The impact of climate change itself is becoming a major driver for action on climate change. But discomfort is not enough. You need hope to make change. The nature of the climate emergency is complex. It includes social, environmental, biological, economic, cultural, and political dynamics. It is created and maintained by an inequitable and destructive maldistribution of wealth and power. Mass public support is required to make real change. While the world is increasingly being made aware of the nature of the problem and the severity of the risk, there will be no change before the focus shifts to the possibility of solutions rather than the intractability of the problems. The complexity of the problem calls for a constellation of resource, uh, re responses. There is no silver bullet, as been pointed out by one of the previous panelists, but we need a spectrum of major reforms across all sectors and all aspects of human life on the planet. It's important to highlight that the fact we already have the technologies we need to stop fuel fuel, fossil fuels and to avoid the calamitous costs they incur. It's not a technical problem. The real obstacles are about political and corporate power. Our response should include positive strategies to address global inequity, changing disease vectors, food security, disaster management capacity, supporting climate refugees, re reducing pollution, and so on. Every extreme weather event provides an opportunity for direct action. Health organizations and social movements can embrace this opportunity by engaging locally and supporting people directly effective, affected. Prior to the last federal election, Australian uh, members of the Greens Party formed working groups to go into flood damaged areas and help people clean up their homes. The Greens went on to win seats in those areas. There are a number of organisations around the world that acknowledge the fundamental link between climate and health and encourage health workers to join in strategies to build an, uh, an, an equitable and sustainable future. Only by developing a positive vision of effective climate action and building mass support for implementing that vision will another world be possible. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Paul. That was a great rundown on the challenges that social movements face. Do we have any questions at this point or we're happy to go on? 
Okay, well, thanks a lot, Paul. And we now welcome our online um, participant, uh, Professor Alexis Benos. Um, Alexis is a professor of social medicine and primary health care at the Aristotle University of Thessalonica, and he's also chair of the People's Health Movement Advisory Committee, which is really a, 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 a committee of the PHM elders that when we've sort of got old enough, we get pushed up to the advisory committee. So go ahead, Alexis. Thank you. Thank you for being with you. I'm sorry not being there. I would like to, but I, it was impossible. So to make time short, I, uh, my presentation, I mean, my, I want to, to share with you some thoughts in order to provoke a discussion, of course. Uh, and I'm going to present you a case of movement here, local movement of anti-extractive movement that is happening in uh, the neighborhood I'm living here in Thessaloniki, Greece, Northern Greece. So uh, there we have a, a long-standing movement against a also long-standing investment uh, of a, a gold mining company, which is, I think, not by chance, also a Canadian-based uh, multinational El Dorado. So the movement was initiated by the local communities which were protecting, trying to protect their environment, their forests, their lives, their, their activities, civilization, and of course their health. The local movement was quickly supported by a diversity of grassroots organizations struggling to protect health, environment, and civil rights of the local communities. The obvious, and it was said uh, very clearly from the last speaker also, that the, the obvious, obvious direct negative impacts of extractive industries, uh, procedures, as it is air pollution, water pollution, uh, heavy metals exposures, and so on, combined with the general impact on climate crisis, raised the health issues as one of the main themes of the growing anti-extracting campaign. These included a series of campaigning meetings in villages, communities, local communities, but also uh, the neighborhood city of Thessaloniki. Impact on both environmental health by the extracting activities, uh, environment, environment and health by the extractive activities were presented in these meetings by academics serving the main goal of science, which is social ac accountability and solidarity. In parallel, I think we've lost the sound. Uh, just to hang on a minute, Alexis. I'm sorry, yes, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, I'm now sorry. we've got it back. Now we've got it back. Yeah, okay, Thank you. Okay. Continue. So I'm going back. Uh, we had a wealth of mobilizations, starting from local gatherings to march, uh, marches up in the forest where the mining. Uh, uh, company's construction site, to massive manifestations in Thessaloniki, the big city. And these mobilizations, of course, were treated with unprecedented violence by the police, throwing tear gases even in schools, in the villages and houses, and getting imprisoned a lot of local uh, activists. This movement, which was tremendous really the last uh, 15 years or, or, or already, raised the awareness of the population and its active defense of the environment and health and delayed politically and legally the ongoing destruction of the forest and uh, that followed the expansion of the company. So it was, this movement was already had a very positive effect in at least delaying the catastrophe. And here is a, an important issue and point, I think, for to discuss also. Unfortunately, the movement was closely connected with the growing influence of the center-left party of Syriza at this time, which actually won the elections early in 2015. The projection of all hopes of the population, of the movement, all, all hopes to close down the, the mining activities to 
the new government was abruptly decomposed due to the unwillingness of the progressive government to fight the leading political and economic interests in the country, but also within European Union. So this resulted in a big de deception, uh, which by its turn uh, produced a deep crisis in the movement, producing incapacity to mobilize anymore further uh, mobilize the population against the, acti the activities of extractive industry. And this has given space to a counterattack by the company. Besides the ongoing catastrophe that is now really going quick uh, of the forest and the living and, and human environment, a politically important move has been made recently made by the company. They started the procedure of strategic lawsuits against public participation. This is internationally known as SLAP, strategic lawsuits against public participation. Suing an activist, a very famous activist here, a reporter, which is Stavrula Pulimeni, because she just uh, reported in the social medias uh, about a court decision. The decision was already made, I mean, condemning the company because they have polluted a specific area, a chemically pollution of a specific area there. Uh, and this, this point, I think, is connecting the local with the global reality. Uh, the trend of using SLAP procedures, if will not be responded by the international movement, it will drive to the complete silence of the mass media, especially when dealing with crimes against the, economy, the environment and humanity, as, for example, is going on with, in Amazon. Another destructive danger, as it was said also by Erika, I think, in the beginning, that we face in Greece too, is the so-called green development. Last year, a big part of... Uh, of uh, the woods in an island called Evia, which is uh, the bigger island in Greece, was uh, the woods were deliberately burned. It is a, a fact now, uh, in order to be replaced by a wood of wind turbines, the so-called eolic energy. So, uh, trying to, to wrap up and put the points I think needs for a bit more discussion is first of all, the experience that we had here in Greece, in Northern Greece, is that social movements defending health and environment in both in the same time can become, become a decisive opponent to the greed induced destructive policies. Scientific evidence brought by committed academics continuing information of the local uh, communities, massive mobilizations of the population at risk are decisive strengths of the movement. In contrary, the assignment of the goals of the movement to any governing party is threatening its independence, its political sharpness, and its population dynamics. And this also is an issue to be discussed, I think. I mean, how we can keep the independence and the, the dynamics of the movement, uh, even we have a pro-movement governments with us in order to keep and to press also these governments to go on with the deliberate policies against the catastrophe. The other issue I want to, 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 to stress is, as I said before, the slap experience which is part of the aggressive, intimidating, and oppressing policies uh, produced by the companies, of course, by the, 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 the global, international, multinational companies, including, of course, killing in Latin America and so on. It has to be considered as an important danger that cannot be dealt without international cooperation. The profit-making and destructing companies are functioning, we have to say that, with a consistency with common international cooperation. They are really the internationalists 
today. So we have to see how the social movements can be international and or enhance international solidarity and political activity in order to become more effective in the struggle for health and environment, which is, also, as it was said also by Erika, as a crucial part of the struggle for another society where the, the, uh, the main values are not uh, serving the greed, but the real needs of the population all over the world. And in closing, I want just to use some words by Hugo Blanco, which is a Peruvian peasant leader and eco-socialist. And he says, the Mapuche people and the women of Iran, the communities of Colombia's Cauca Valley, the Zapatistas and dark-skinned immigrants are not suffering collateral damage, nor are they affected just by economic interests. Rather, they are military targets of those protecting the transnational corporations and banks that deal with gold, gas, timber, water, and crops. It is all about money and power. Social movements in defense of our territories, whether at the level of the community, neighborhood, individual, spirituality or consciousness are our hope to tackle hunger, sickness and environmental destruction. And it is by organizing and sharing our experiences that we can progress from demanding our rights to recovering our lost autonomy. But that is what we are here for, to transform the world and ourselves. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexis. Uh, you, you told us so much, particularly, I mean, seeing the destruction of forests as another extraction that's happened under extractive capitalism, the power of the slap laws that are um, just really defeating people, and, and also that we really need an international movement because capital is organized internationally and is increasingly looking at repressive measures. So that was fantastic, Alexis. Um, our next speaker is um, Mbali Badzuza, who comes from South Africa. And in our earlier session in this room, we heard from David Boyd, who's a Canadian human rights lawyer. And Mbali is a legal researcher which, with Section 27 in South Africa, which is a public interest law center. So we're going to hear more about the power of the law and activism. Thanks, Mbali. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, I'm Bari Baduza, a legal researcher at Section 27 and also uh, the Deputy Secretary of the Climate Justice Coalition of South Africa. So perhaps it's prudent to begin with an extract from Philip Austin, the former UN Special Repertoire on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in their seminal 2019 uh, report on climate change and poverty when they said, human rights activity is bureaucratized and sanitized, satisfying itself with formal procedural outcomes that might have little direct real world impact. The roots of human rights and the real driving force for progress can only come from community mobilization. Governments overwhelmingly stand for the status quo and thus are unlikely to take a strong lead when radical change is needed. Much of the human rights community retains strong grassroots links and is well placed to encourage and facilitate community mobilization. Without it, the natural complacency of governmental elites and the vested interests of financial elites will lead them to continue sleepwalking towards catastrophe. So while my fellow panelists who have been great uh, have spoke about the current activism and the work that they're doing today, and how that continues to bring us hope, I would like to take us a bit back in the, into the past and remember that uh, hope is with us always and that people's power has always existed. So I'd like to talk to you about the South African health rights discourse um, by exploring rich and uh, strategic lessons from the treatment action campaign, the TAC, an HIV AIDS activist social movement or organization 
which undoubtedly offers examples of best practice of rights-based approaches for transformative ends. And that is what the climate justice movement around the world is fighting for, social, political, economic, and environmental transformation. In other words, a systems change through a just transition to a low carbon economy or net zero that leaves, people, that leaves no one behind. And I would encourage you to follow the work of Section 27 and the Climate Justice Coalition of South Africa who are exemplifying uh, this work. So, what did the TAC do in the 1990s and 2000s? What they did was they embraced the politics of rights and the commons. For developing countries, particularly in the global south, human rights emerged as a transformative paradigm, one that seeks greater social justice in the developmental agenda. So human rights practice has led to meaningful victories for both different groups of people and individuals. By way of example, the TAC used the political character of the rights-based approach in championing public health uh, during the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa. Health rights discourse benefited from the strategic and indispensable com combination of social mobilization, public awareness with litigation and education, and constitutional or political advocacy. And by deploying the, the politics of rights, the TAC used three points of power as leverage. And Donella Meadows defines leverage points as the places within a complex system where a small shift in one thing can produce big changes in everything. The first leverage point initially emerged in 1998 when the TAC was founded by a small group of political activists. At this time, South Africa had the fastest growing HIV epidemic in the world. AIDS was, caught, was causing up to 600 deaths a day. And despite this, the government uh, did not provide treatment with people living with HIV. Aided by a human rights framework, the TAC began to mobilize people in the efforts to campaign for HIV uh, medication, for people to have access to it. The TAC was acutely aware that the HIV epidemic ran rampant along the lines of gender and race inequality. And the climate crisis has a similar characteristic on who it disproportionately affects. So with this ap appreciation, the TAC built and sourced its social mobilization capacity directly from the poor and the marginalized. And by the time litigation was ripe in 2002, the TAC had gathered community-based activists who not only now understood how to articulate their rights, but also how to apply them towards their social and political demands. And this was through public awareness and HIV treatment literacy campaigns. So in other words, the first leverage point of power was a representative mass movement, which informed the capability of a rights-based approach from the ground up. The second leverage point emerged in 2002 uh, through strategic litigation. In the landmark case of Minister of Health versus the Treatment Action Campaign, the TAC approached the Constitutional Court alleging that the government had been violating the rights of people living with HIV to access healthcare services, as well as the right of children uh, to basic healthcare services. The social and political context underpinning this was the fact that approximately 80,000 newborn babies per year were being transmitted with HIV through birth and lactation. In response to this crisis, the government uh, had introduced an antiretroviral drug, nevirapine, to prevent mother and child transmissions. However, this drug was only made available in pilot sites, none of which were public health facilities. Consequently, the program excluded the most vulnerable people who depended on the state uh, for provision of healthcare services. So the court found that the policy was unreasonable and ordered that uh, the drugs be made available throughout the country. This victory subsequently led to an increase in the health budgetary allocation 
which resulted in the world's largest government-funded HIV AIDS program, extending free access even to residents of neighboring countries. I would like to pause here because I think it's important for the climate and health movement to note that the TAC didn't attempt the mammoth task of demanding that ART be made available to everyone all at once. Despite it being a desperate need with over 6 million people living with HIV at the time, the TAC strategically demanded that nevirapine be offered to women specifically in order to prevent future transmissions to children. And children are a particularly vulnerable demographic who are strongly protected in our constitution. Therefore, the second leverage point of power was the pursuit of rights through litigation to achieve policy alternatives in line with people's needs. So choose an issue. Be strategic in identifying the points of power. Is it maternal and child health and the impacts of climate change there? Is it climate and health? Uh, is it climate and migration health issues around access? Is it the lack of climate-proof health infrastructure? The third and last leverage point is political or constitutional advocacy using a normative rights, a normative framework of rights and obligations. For example, while mobilizing the first leverage point and litigating the second uh, leverage point, before and after the TAC and other international NGOs were also lobbying against pharmaceutical industries to drop prices of ART medication. And this was through sustained campaigning. The outcome of the campaigns led to sizable drops in the prices of medicines. The leverage point of power here had redistributive effects by directly challenging private actors and economic policies, which had commodified health in the name of profits over people's health. So as the climate and health movement, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have the tools. Perhaps what we need to do is push the boundaries even further to be bold because of the urgency of the climate crisis. But one thing is for sure, and as history has proven time and time again, advancing the language or the politics of rights is a powerful tool. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Mbali, and particularly for really giving us those lessons from the successful TAC uh, movement. And also, you know, talking about those leverage points, I think that's really important. And I think we'll also notice that com common themes are coming out from all the activisms. Well, I'm going to go on to the last speaker, then please start standing up for your questions. Um, Madhurish Kumar is currently based in Paris in France, and he's an activist researcher with the Atlantic Institute there. So o over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, and thanks to People's Health Movement for inviting me. Uh, I speak here, currently I'm a senior fellow for, uh, at Atlantic Institute, but I speak here uh, on behalf of uh, National Alliance of People's Movement, of which I have been a member and I used to be a national convener for more than a decade, uh, spending time in trenches on the front lines of movement and also being a part of the global uh, climate justice movement. And I think what I'm going to talk about is that what has the climate justice movement done and what is the intersection between the climate justice movement and the uh, public health movement, uh, that's, and how we can make a contribution to that. And I think something which we have done as climate justice movement, and our role has been constantly to make things visible, because it's not that the climate crisis didn't exist, people didn't know about it. We are aware of the Exxon uh, papers which have been leaked, that how in 70s their own in-house researchers told about that the climate change is real, it is the fossil, burning fossil fuels is impacting the climate, but they successfully hide it. And they were successful in it because they, they built a wave of uh, misinformation around it. And this is what the climate justice movement had done. Uh, so this is what the earlier times was. 
that the killing for coal, because we know about that how very successfully our whole industrial revolution has been built on the fossil fuels, the model we are following at the moment. And the, the coal unions were very powerful. This picture is from the 1914, uh, the, the historic strike in US. And similarly, we know in UK how in 70s and 80s, the Margaret Thatcher, uh, the coal miners strike and they broke it down. And then in India, we have had many uh, coal strikes. We have been, there have been constant criticism from the people's movement where I come from, where we have fought many battles around displacement and how we fought against them. But land displacement, forest cover and all, but that doesn't get enough attention until in the early 21st century and later in 2010 around that, the public health angle started really coming up and that the, how the devastating impact coal is having, that it's, it's deadly, it's killing people. We need to do something about it. And that's when the several strategic moments like this picture from the Greenpeace or the Green MPs here who are, talk, who are uh, coming into a, it's in Australia where they're coming into a gala with the messages. And there have been several demonstrations where the, and the reports that how coal is killing. And this is where uh, another report from the fossil fuel caused 8.7 million deaths globally. This is in 2018. There are a number earlier also, people have cited figures because different research is all based on modeling. So we'll have here different numbers. The point is that it's really killing and the public health as an angle has really shifted that balance actually. The, the fact that we have been talking about how coal and fossil fuel mining has been actually impacting land, water, health, and we have used tactics where we have come up with the research and shown that, look, this is what it is impacting. It's causing massive problems to us. So we are using the public health angle to make it visible because somehow or the other, when people lose their livelihood because they are dispossessed from their land, that doesn't seem to affect the politicians. In India, we do not even have a data overall that how many people have been displaced from their land because of infrastructure, big infrastructure development projects. So this is what has been going on and we have been using this successfully. In, in West, the big public health institutions are coming, but then what is our job in India where the big public health institutions will, or researchers or the Indian Institute of Technology or the, uh, the big research institutes won't come out with this because they are with the government. So what we do, we are training the community uh, activists to take measurement of the water, how polluted it is, capture, learn to capture the air pollution and work with them and then use that as a making, for, use that as a successful uh, a litigation tool, something which my friend from South Africa mentioned. This is another of the tactics that how to make air pollution and Maria was mentioning about the cotton sheet experiment. There were some things which we did in India on a similar line that you put the white lungs and then how it is breathing the pollution and how it's had turning on day 10, it becomes completely dark. This was put across the country just to make it visible and draw attention that look, this is not, we see the smog, but it is having a real impact. We cannot just keep going about the business as usual. It requires a big mobilization. You cannot just go on and win on your own. Uh, and that it means it requires combination of not only the grassroots mobilization, mobilization on the ground, but also building a big community of the health workers. The healthcare without harm is sitting here, but then the, the, who have been mobilizing very successfully the, the medical fraternity, and they have taken this to the next level by bringing in with the industry, but health professionals and others. And we are using the mothers, kids, and using as a successful litigation method to go and petition the Supreme Court in the country. And this has had impact. Similarly, as you said that the last year, this year you didn't have the firecrackers in uh, Kyrgyzstan. In India also, we have had several judgments now where they have banned cars, we have, they have banned firecrackers. We have a Dipavali, the festival of lights, where uh, bursting crackers is part of the rituals. I don't know when it happened because back in ages there were no crackers, but it still is part of the rituals. Uh, and, uh, but the, the courts have come out and said that we have to ban it. We can no more just keep bursting as if it's business as usual. So these are the many things which have been happening uh, there. But then you think that you have made certain things visible, but then what do we do about things which are very proud of and which those are, the, the fossil fuel industry continues to build. Now, this picture is here because it concerns gas. 
We had the Ukraine war and suddenly the whole world, at least in Europe where I live nowadays, the whole Europe, there is a winter is coming and we are going to have a very cold winter because gas from Russia is not going to come. Now, a one war and suddenly everything goes in uh, disarray. We have a number of fossil fuel plants, LNG terminals, gas fields and others which were put on a hold because we were moving towards uh, climate phase, uh, fossil fuel phase out in line with the Paris uh, Agreement goals. But suddenly all of them become visible. They are back online. And there is a massive growth which we are witnessing today on the fossil fuel gas. Uh, but, and the industry suddenly came up and said that we are part of the solution. The fossil fuel industry is going to provide heating in the homes. Nobody will be cold in, left out in the cold. But these two studies which are there now, that the gas stove which we are using in our home they are leaking, they are the burning, they, they, are, they are causing inside indoor pollution and the people are having suffering because of that. If nearly one out of, one third of the US household have gas in their homes and they are releasing NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which is responsible for 12.7% of all asthma cases in US. So there is visible now uh, research which is coming and we are making it visible that look, gas Cooking on gas, it's a, there's a propaganda around that you see the flames and how the food tastes different and everything. So in the West, that's the problem. But in the global South, in our country, where gas is still, we are trying to get people out of the biomass. There was a, pro, there was a discussion yesterday. But then, is gas really the future? Is that where we should be going? Should we be locking our investment and the, us into a gas infrastructure for next 30, 50 years? Why don't we go into the renewable straight? Because that's where the future is. And we say gas is not only while cooking, but also when it's shut down, when we have turned off our gas stoves, it's still leaking. It's leaking methane. And methane is deadly compared to, uh, it's a big uh, greenhouse gas emission source. Unfortunately, all our efforts, combined efforts, it's not working because what is happening? That social movements are using different uh, and uh, different uh, strategy levers. We are constantly innovating. We are mobilizing forces, but Look at the IEA, International Energy Agency projections. In 2022, the coal consumption grew to the maximum. The natural gas demand was supposed to 20, they say that if we have to achieve net zero, then by 2021, no new gas and oil field will have to come up online. But we're already seeing that the one war and it has thrown everything in this area. Point is, because the global scenario, unless those who are in power, they act, things are not going to change. And when we say they are, they are going to change, it will not happen precisely because the multilateral system of governance, WHO, uh, we had talked about and has been a big part of uh, this discussion, but the WHO itself is fine, the, their hands are tied because the multi-stakeholderism, that has actually taken deep roots into the system. And it's same way in the COP this year, there were 620 or 640 some fossil fuel lobbyists who were at the COP. If they are going to dominate our discussions on the climate conversation, then are we really sure that we are going to meet the Paris Climate Act goals? We are not going to do that. So unless we really change this broken uh, global governance system, that cannot happen. And people's movement can only add power to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was really good and thank you for um, saying how important it is to make things visible and that might be one of the difficulties in Bali with, with HIV AIDS was very visible the impact whereas people don't entirely see the impact of climate change and also for emphasizing the problems with multi-stakeholders and where everybody talks as if all the power partners are equal when in fact the power differences are unimaginable so that's really good okay we can now have some comments or questions from the floor um i i'd i'd really like to um to get some other people's questions, but if we haven't at the moment, I might, Paul, I think one of the slides you showed was you um, chaining yourself to the road in Adelaide, because would you want to say a bit why you felt compelled to work for Extinction Rebellion? Thanks, Fran. Yeah, I, th I think 
the basic driver was everything else has failed. We have tried to go through the formal political channels. We've tried lobbying. We've tried all those sorts of things that you're encouraged to do with petitions to parliamentarians and representations to your local member and so on. And deaf ears. Nothing, nothing happened. Nothing was heard. And so the next thing is to actually say, hey, this is really serious. And one way to say this is really serious is by taking direct action and disrupting. Um, the action that I showed the slide of was of a group of um, Extinction Rebellion uh, rebels in, in Adelaide and South Australia. We um, chained ourselves to, to prams, to pram, infants' prams, because part of our messaging was this is about our children and our children's children. This is about the future. And we chained ourselves to those prams and we glued ourselves to the road right in the centre of the city and we blocked the traffic and we caused a huge fuss. And we got a lot of media attention and we got a lot of people saying, this is really good what you're doing. And a lot of other people saying, this is really terrible, you've made me late for work. <laughs> but we actually made the issue visible and I think that's, that's the, the crucial thing, raising the awareness. And I think that's stage one and what I'm hoping is that there is now enough popular awareness and enough popular concern that we can go beyond stage one and say, okay, we now see the problem, what we need now is action and what we need now is solutions. And I think that the thing that is making that possible is the visibility of extreme climatic events. I don't know if people have been following the news from New Zealand in the last couple of days. There have been huge floods in the North Island of New Zealand, unprecedented rainfall. Uh, the old thing about one in a hundred year events happening every few weeks seems to be coming true. The, this, these impacts do affect people's lives. People do sit up and take notice. And increasingly, I think that means people are going to be motivated to take action. And I noticed that the New Zealand government minister said this directly was a result of climate change. What well, wasn't sort of denying that. David, I can yeah, see hello. you've got a question there. Well, thank you. Uh, because uh, David Nabarro here, and just, okay, so a lot of visibility is needed. And stories of success, like that of the Treatment Action Campaign, absolutely brilliant. But there's something underlying the conversation that I've heard that makes me wonder how to move forward. It really, it was in Paul's statement, but it was there in others as well. That if it's going to be possible to take this to the next level, an incredible amount of strategic discipline is called for. It's not just tactics, it's actually the way of working, selecting the targets carefully, and then maneuvering so as not to get shut down, having multiple lines on which to work, connecting regionally, as in Central Asia, on air pollution, connecting globally, establishing new narratives that are strong enough to take hold, particularly as we heard from Ecuador. And I just wanted to ask the question, how can one work for this kind of strategic discipline in what is by definition a non-disciplined multi-stakeholder movement? Will it lead to fragmentation because of disagreements and even quite robust battles about how to act. What are the lessons from the shift in tactics that Paul described in his own work or the tactical shift in Extinction Rebellion that was announced in the UK? How easy is it to get a collective focus on specific targets and to avoid schisms? This is we're seeing this as the challenge of many political parties that are seeking ways to shift in the way that has happened in Colombia. And I'm just curious, uh, without wishing to be inquisitive, without wishing to 
get access to information that's not my right to access, but I'm intrigued by how the people's health movement will respond and what will happen in perhaps in Kali as this notion of strategic discipline moves forward, if it does. Thank you. Thanks, David. Erica. First thing I want to say, uh, David, is that this strategic notion, blah, blah, it's one concept from the global north, right? So if you talk to me, if this is the solution, I'm going to say, no, there's no one solution. And I cannot reply for the whole movement, but we have, I'm going to say what we have done in the people's health hearing, which is kind of what we've done. The, the, the graphic that was there, back there, we, we've done and been interacting from the global south with youth in the global north, in the UK in the, during the COP26. And what we have been, it's a challenge also to decolonize ourselves in the movement. Like what the Global North understands as a solution. For instance, the, the Green New Deal. Like everybody in the US and the UK think the Green New Deal would be the solution. And we don't, we don't, because we have seen this all over again. So to be a strategic only agenda, that, that does not, like solutions, simple solutions, one-minded, like if, if you would, would be in the UN or if you would be in the Western world, does not flow in a movement that that's supposed to be diverse, diverse, have a multiple voices, have different things, different scenarios in Africa, different scenarios in Ecuador. So I do think we need to have different strategies in Latin America. I might say in my country, mobilizations are huge. And um, in 2019, I had, uh, and I'm trying to be really short. I had like, we as a movement mobilized against the rise in prices in oil prices for, for gas, right? If you would be green and so, super like um, militant, you would say, how can you go with the mobilizations uh, uh, um, that make gas cheaper because the corporations and blah, blah, blah. But then you go to the field and you see that chickens, instead of Costing four dollars, if you rise the price of oil in my country, people were buying it in twelve dollars. So are you demanding things based on your view of what a single solution would be? Or are you in territory seeing what happens when you rise oil prices? People are left with no, no food. So you cannot, what I am trying to say is that there are multiple solutions. There will be multiple tensions and we need to again, acknowledge the anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal, anti-racist, and all, um, it's anti-racist view, which is kind of a work of ourselves also in the movement to kind of have this complicated, tense talks. That's great, yeah, and I, I, I mean, I suspect that if you look at the history of any social movement that's been successful, there has been kind of let a thousand blossoms bloom rather than just one, you know, that that's what creates the groundswell. But I can see in Bali and then Paul want to add, and Alexis, put your hand up when you'd like to. He would too, so there's three. And Bali, Paul, and then Alexis. Sure. Um, perhaps to give an example of what we're doing in South Africa is the work of the Climate Justice Coalition. So uh, we are a movement uh, filled with trade unions, grassroots and uh, community organizations, NPOs, uh, churches, youth movements, uh, we're quite a diverse group of people. Uh, and we started off in 2019 uh, with the youth strikes uh, in December. So we got together and we looked at the reality of South Africa. We are the most unequal country in the world. Uh, when we talk about the climate crisis or environmental issues, it's considered a white middle class issue. So what we decided was that we had two transformative um, uh, paradigms to deal with. One was climate action. The other was resolving the struggles of unemployment, uh, poverty, and injustice, so, or, or, in, or violence even. So we had these two imperatives that had to work together. And what we've been doing is we've uh, developed different working groups in the, in the, in the coalition. One is legal. 
Uh, recently, we made submissions to uh, the climate change bill in our parliament, and we got uh, our grassroots movements to make submissions on their issues, linking, for instance, the lack of water, the issue with shelter, the issue with food, with the climate crisis. We have the energy task team, uh, which deals with ESCOM, um, which is our... Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, our, it's where we get our energy uh, and our electricity and it's currently in crisis. And we have a campaign called the Green New ESCOM campaign where we are uh, asking uh, ESCOM to move away from coal into uh, using re renewable energy. Uh, we have our communications task team that's uh, using the language of ordinary people to translate this complicated science or make visible the links between uh, the climate crisis and the everyday. Uh, we have uh, the economics uh, justice task team because in South Africa, so South Africa is one of the uh, highest emitters of the world, definitely of the continent. And as an unequal country, our rich people have benefited from um, you know, uh, the emissions of fossil fuels, yet we have the most vulnerable and poor people in the country. So the, the, economic, task team, the economic justice task team is looking at um, introducing a, a campaign around the wealth tax. So we are targeting different uh, elements of, of this fight, uh, and we're doing it in diversity, and we're doing it uh, with a lot of effort. Um, so it is, it is possible. Thanks, Mbali. Um, oh, oh, could go, could, perhaps, yeah, we'll go Paul and then Alexis and, yeah, go on and... Thanks, Fran. Just very briefly to address your concerns, David, about um, any risk of schism within the movement. I think um, our greatest ally in preventing that is, in fact, transnational fossil fuel business because what we are facing increasingly are increasingly visible and increasingly severe uh, examples of, of extreme climate change. And as uh, right-wing governments forever have pointed out, when there's a risk of schism in the country, you solve it by introducing an external threat, preferably a military one. And I think the analogy that's been made by uh, climate action advocates that the emergency we are facing is like a, wall, a world war. And the mobilisation we need is the kind of mobilisation we saw, say, in the Second World War. And that's what brings people together. It's dealing with that extreme threat, awareness of that threat, and the realisation that if we don't get it together, we're done for. Yeah, okay, thanks, Paul. And Alexis, and, and then we'll go to <coughs> Madhurish. Okay, thanks, David, for this uh, discussion that you raised. I think that obviously, as it was said, every people, every even community has have their own culture, their own problems, and so on and so on. So, of course, there are a lot of alternatives and a lot of movements globally that are uh, struggling for perhaps the same issues, but with different ways. For, in my view, the strategic point to all this movement, global movement, and where there is no schism, and and by definition, I think, is to see that all what we are dealing with from the environment, health, employment, unemployment, and so on, so poverty, is that exactly the majority of the global population is getting worse and just a few people are getting richer. So this is a class struggle. And I think the strategic view of all the movement, all, all the, uh, the global movement, can be seen as a part, every movement can be seen as a part of the global movement in order to change the society from a society of class struggle to a society that is replying to the needs of the population with equality and democracy. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis, for reminding us of, of that important political economy perspective on this. Um, Madarish. Thank you. I think... I'm not worried about that we are, that movements are seen as divided or if there are uh, divisions. I see it actually differently that if we are to focus on what is the collective points of agreement, then most those who claim, those who say that they are truly into climate justice movements, not of singular movement, but movements, they all agree on that it's real the emergency is real, that we need to do and save to, we need to save the earth. 
we need to save ourselves. We are all against fossil fuel companies because if you are not against them, you know that the science is real and that we need to find a solution. Now, I think where we disagree is that we disagree at times on solutions. And I think it comes out of the, our own location where we are. If I look from here, if sitting in India, if I look above, I see my own sky. Somebody sitting in Germany sees their own sky, but we are all looking at the sky and the, we all have the sun and the moon. And we think it's like our own bubble we all live in. But I think that bubble is somehow connected. The solutions are national, they are also regional, and they are also global. But does any one of us have or can truly claim to be global? I think except for Americans who do claim to be global. <laughs> Pardon, but <laughs> because three people sit there and set up an organization called Global Commons Foundation and they really set up, so that's okay. But I think, uh, but that happens. But uh, my point is that it, unless we really are trying to the, we draw some principles and say that this is what we are going to actually work on. So those principles for me are, okay, self-sufficiency. If US wants to maintain its level of everybody has 2,500 cc cars running on full diesel, please run it in your own backyard. Don't look outside the world. Try and do it for some times. Perhaps you will learn it, but how long can that last? And I think the Gandhi said that the world has enough for everybody's needs, but not for everybody's greed. And that greed is being fulfilled. The US is a big country. They might be able to do it. But what about Brussels, Netherlands, and a lot of other smaller countries? If they really want to maintain that kind of lifestyle and the consumption, then please try and do it with the resources you have. And I think that will start giving us solutions that what kind of life we can live. So self-sufficiency, self-reliance, decentralized, unless we look at the decentralized thing. And I think we will have to have these conversations. We will have to talk to each other. At times, we get lost in the global north and global south. I see, I see it slightly differently. There is north in the south, and there is south in the north as well. We have somebody in the previous session, we were talking about Obamacare, that in US, there's the most unequal. 30 million people don't have access to health care. So it's the same in India or in other places. So I think we need to look at there is inequality everywhere. So unless we try and address those, and thanks for Alexis that he brought at this point, at the end of the day, it's a class struggle. Unless we look at that, it's not going to happen. So I'm not going to be so worried about that coming across as divided, but I think what binds us together, perhaps we can take that as the starting point and that our solutions, if we base them on certain principles, then we will not be harming others in the way we try and look for solutions. If you want EVs, everybody wants to run on Tesla, please try and do it from inside. Don't go to Colombia looking for uh, critical minerals or don't go to Congo looking for critical minerals. Fine. So I think we have to make those choices. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Hani. Thank you very much, uh, Fran. Uh, two quick points. Um, I think it's quite important to keep delegitimizing the use of multi-stakeholderism. Um, and I think this is quite important. We, we can welcome multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral, even multi-stakeholder, but we need to, to say exactly why this stakeholder should be involved, who this stakeholder is representing. And having the corporates and private sector represented is not legitimized because they just um, represent shareholders. This does not legitimize them to be part of the decision making. It legitimizes them to follow what will be agreed publicly and not to be part of the decision making at all. The second point, which I think equally important, we, we need to connect the struggles together while thinking of where these COPs, climate change uh, conferences are being held, next year it's gonna be in Emirates. We cannot separate this from what Emirates is doing in Yemen. And to what extent having these big fora legitimize and placing the act of these regimes, this is quite important. So while we are 
trying to struggle for against climate change. We cannot forget those people who are being killed in Yemen and having cholera and having other because of the act from the government and the country we are going together in. I think this is quite important. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Hani. And I think what, Hani, you were talking to with the multi stakeholder is that there are very real conflicts of interest that shouldn't be allowed to come to the table, just as in other forums we ensure that people declare their interests. So would anybody like to, to comment on the multi stake or, or just on that issue of conflicts of interest? I was just wondering, Maria, is that, is that an issue for you? Or, or, or maybe I'll pass to um, Erica. Yeah, okay, Erica. I just, I just posted this question in the World Bank panel. The question was, Chevron Texaco, which is an oil company, we have been suing as a country 30 years. We have all the data, the studies, everything. It, we won in our national courts after the U.S. said they don't have jurisdiction and everything. We, we have not been able to be paid for compensation for all the disasters that we have. Now, after Ecuador come back to the ICSB, which is the, uh, the mechanism of negotiation of the World Bank, um, oil companies are suing my country for damages to the stakeholders, to, for damages to corporations. There is no way we can refuse to pay, as Chevron has refused to pay, because simply through the World Bank and through the ICSD, ICSD, they said, for example, Luxembourg, you have Ecuador's money in your assets. Please froze those assets. That, that, those assets now belong to this oil company. So it is terrible that these stakeholders, and now when, when I see and I listen in COP26, 27, like, you don't worry. The World Bank are these stakeholders are going to help you poor underdeveloped nations to tackle and have green energy and clean energy, I only feel like they're gonna have, we're gonna have more debt, we're gonna have more devastation, and nobody is taking the responsibility of the contamination of 30 years we have been through the formal processes and the governance structure and is, is the country responsible? The country cannot be responsible because there's not the same power that we have as the World Bank has. Yeah, thanks. So that's really saying that these power imbalances are vital and you can't, and so often multi-stakeholderism assumes that they're equal. Okay, let's... Say, can I just... Yeah, one, sure, one point, sure. sorry. Yeah, go, go. On this multi-stakeholderism, I, I find it really funny that uh, somebody who created a crime, they're really environmental criminals. If you make them as a party, like it's the 1984, the worst industrial disaster in India, Bhopal gas tragedy. Now, if we were to make Dow Corporation as the equal stakeholder, then I mean, they need to be in jail, not negotiating with the victims and saying that, they, that they, they will decide what will happen. The government has to come in and government has to take that part. Chevron, Exxon, if they have impacted, they need to be in jail, plain and simple. I don't know in which rule they are called into multi-stakeholder forums and given a seat at the high table to decide that this is what the world should be doing. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rhiannon. Yeah, um, thanks so much, everyone. I have a question, like, build, I guess, building on the, like, who are our enemies, but also, like, who are the fake friends? Um, and I wanted to just ask the panel how they felt that movement should um, deal with big philanthropy now that, like, climate change and health is all sexy. And, um, you know, we have all these, like, foundations coming in and conveniently supporting groups and solutions which don't challenge them or their power or the system at all. Um, I recommend that nobody read Bill Gates' book about climate change. And if you see it in a shop, um, I hide it um, because it is truly so terrible. Um, so I was just wondering, like they've infiltrated our movement so much as like kind of fake friends. And yeah, I was wondering how the panel thought that that should be dealt with. Thanks. Is there one of the panel who would like to 
so I think it, it's it's asking us how how do you deal with I guess the corporate playbook about kind of co-opting the opposition. Are there examples of that people can point to or from your your work? Yeah, go. I don't want to talk this much about this. Yeah. What we did in the Chevron Texaco audience here, that's that's how it be dealt. Like exposing um I think also rejecting like uh, <laughs> I have this wonderful anecdote. We went to the consortium of, of consortium of universities for global health. When I was in the movement, I was like 20 years old. It, it was David Legg's idea. We went to Seattle with Honey because we, we thought it would be nice to talk to global health universities about the political economy of health. And then it started in Seattle. We, I, we don't have idea. And then it started with like Mother Teresa. Then they put like um, Malcolm X, then Martin Luther King, and then Bill Gates. And we were, what? <laughs> what? What just happened? <laughs> and you have there uh, Melinda Gates talking about how great solution it is to give um, for diarrhea to pack again, uh, with, co with Coca-Cola, like the oral, suero oral, oral solution for children because Coca-Cola reach every every time in the world, every, every, every uh, territory in the world. And Honey and I were like, what? <laughs> and we were the only ones crazy, like going, no, no, this is not. So it, even if you are the only one, we should speak out. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Can, can I just? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is a complex question, precisely because I think that in one hand, there are visible symptoms. And many of us here, I think, in one way or the other, are related to some philanthropy. So, and like Rockefeller said here, I mean, it's all oil money. Or the, or, and they have a his history where they are coming from. So we cannot avoid it. And I think in some ways, we do call them the necessary evil. It's a necessary evil it has become because the philanthropic capitalism is actually part of the multi-stakeholder stakeholderism. They have pushed it in a major, major way. We, uh, me and another colleague, we did a, a study on the multi-stakeholderism last year and we looked at the five, uh, five sectors and the PHM was very much part of that and others. And what we found that in the, in the global health governance system, 1999, the Bill and Melinda Gates was founded and in 2000, since the time that they have come in, uh, that they have fundamentally changed the whole global health governance system. I mean, they pay, they pay WHO, they pay all the major forums which are being done. They have paid the media, they have paid uh, every uh, uh, researchers, they fund many of the health institutions. They, they, their funding power is so huge that the, the one who pays, you will not hear the criticism. You cannot criticize it. So to find that is very little out there. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. The point is, we say, we are all using Apple, Apple phone and other things, but there is two views on it. One, the tools of the masters will not destroy the master, but on the other hand, there is other also, that you have nothing else to lose except your chains. So we have to make the choice. Even while we live in that world, we continue to break that and rebuild it. And I think that's the only way we can do it. We are aware that what we are, the well we are living in and how poisoned it is. So I think we have to really keep looking at it, being aware, and constantly keep fighting it. That's the only way I see it. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks. An important Can I say message something? There. It's, oh, um, oh, Alexis, go ahead. Um, oh, me? No, Alexis, go ahead, then Maria, then... Oh, okay. Ah, me, okay. Just a point about philanthropic capitalism. I think that, uh, uh, I mean, it is uh, really, as it was said before, uh, a great hypocrisy and I think as movement we have to start being much more uh, severe against that. I mean, uh, the idea is we have the same all over the world, of course. The idea is that we have a, a big tax evasion by all these big companies and after that they are giving us some uh, bits and parts as a philanthropy. 
no, thank you. I mean, we have to raise that and say, no, thank you. We don't need your philanthropy. We need your taxes. And then we can use these taxes for health, environment, and so on and so on. So we have to raise also the tax evasion issues. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for raising that, Alexis. And Maria. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, um, you know, it's a difficult question, of course, uh, especially when you are, when you belong to a, a developing country, relatively small country, the region that the participant uh, had no idea where actually I come from, and there is not much news and much activities going on in Central Asia, and especially in Kyrgyzstan. But um, I just remember that it's it's very it's very um, to me uh, it's not the easy like the to advocate uh, for green solutions. For example, like. Uh, today, of course, we're on the same page with the gas, but many years ago, when we just started our, our air quality campaign, air, clean air campaign, the Gazprom came to the government, to the meetings, because we don't have gas in Kyrgyzstan, our own gas, and they said, like, here's the solution, and we will give it to you. Um, you build the infrastructure, you also uh, invest a bit, and then we will give you the gas and this is solution and that's how all people will not suffer from the air pollution. Uh, and, and still there are negotiations like this and despite the fact that so a civil society is strong and we advocate for other renewable energy solutions for us, it's not easy to fight with the strong, you know, a strong neighbor and also uh, our government, for example, just a few weeks ago, uh, we were in the meeting and they said like, um, okay guys, we, you are very active, thank you for doing this. Now we know that the problem exists, but we don't have money. Please bring us investors, please, please bring us donors, uh, please bring us someone who will build up the, uh, and you call uh, bracket, um, um, how it's called in English, sorry I forgot, when you when you do something with the call, and then it becomes cleaner. And bring us this money and we will do this. Yes, from the World Bank, from the Russia, from international community. And this is very hard to, uh, you know, to build up our green solutions, because I really, really understand what the panelists were saying uh, about the reality that we face with, whether we should choose gas and then the house probably, or the climate change negative effects of the temperature inversions of the also emissions from the gas and etc. And then without uh, being able to pay for this gas, right? Because it's getting expensive or because uh, your neighbor suddenly stopped liking you because you don't support him or support it. Yes, so thank you. Okay, thanks Maria and Paul. Yeah, just, Rhiannon, um, I think there are a couple of principles and maybe, maybe a couple of tactics that apply to addressing the question. The first thing is follow the money. Where's the money coming from? Where's it going to? And secondly, okay, who are the winners and who are the losers? And then write it all up, publicise it, get it through whatever communication channels are available and expose it because these mechanisms and the, the other mechanisms that are used by the giant transnational corporations to capture our governments need to be exposed. I think we, we've all agreed that we need to see action at a local level, at a national level, and at a global level. But um, at currently, the main regulatory mechanisms we have for um, it, it making the place safe for, for, for people and other living things are at a national level. And our national governments have been captured. And what we need to do is really campaign around reclaiming our governments, reclaiming our governments from transnational corporate dominance and publicising the fact that they have been captured and that they're working against people's interests. Reclaim our governments. Great. Thanks, Paul. And what, one question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, fabulous presentation and uh, talks. It's, uh, it's, it's a great thing. 
Um, uh, I have one question, maybe something related to what was before, but on the perspective of the international organizations, international mechanisms uh, that's supposed to control or supposed to call for the responsibility. The social moment is, uh, uh, is not safe uh, in all countries. In some countries, uh, it can be qualified as an attempted cope. Uh, uh, and the people who are active and trying to change something can be fired from their work. I mean, it's not open, it's not formally, but we know about it. So my uh, question maybe will uh, sound a bit naive, but my question is, um, uh, what are effective mechanisms to hold states accountable to their international obligations? Because we understand that the air pollution is something which has no boundary, geographical, I mean. I mean, uh, uh, for example, uh, our country is, uh, my country has signed a lot of conventions and part of a lot of international papers and also recently signed, for example, a regional document of the uh, air pollution. But, I mean, is there any mechanism or any example of the, uh, when activists could reach that mechanisms to put the countries uh, uh, to call for their responsibility, for their obligations, international obligations. There are a lot of co-organizers uh, co of this conference, like UN agencies and others. I'm just curious, are they effective? Um, uh, are they useful at least, you know? Thank you. Could, could you tell us your name and country? Uh, my name is Elimira Jaldoshova. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. I'm working for FHI 360. Uh, and I'm really proud that Maria could raise this question here. And then Maria, we don't have many activists who are now bravely can talk about the air pollution because it's a bit unsafe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's a challenge about, you know, how you can hold your governments to account. I, I, I guess in Bali, that's what exactly what Section 27 is about. Yes, that's exactly. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about um, the case called Cancel Call. So our Department of uh, uh, Energy and Mineral Resources has released an integrated resource plan for 2019, which is how we're going to generate electricity for the next five to 10 years. And their plan is to introduce new coal fire power plants. And CER uh, are taking this, this, this resource plan to court. And they relied on certain uh, legislation internationally, so looking at the, at the Paris Agreement, for example, and looked at some of our constitutional rights, like the right to a healthy environment. And while this is an impressive case, a very important case, our intervention was like, the Paris Agreement mentions human rights sporadically, um, and there's nothing we can do to hold states accountable in terms of human rights using climate uh, legislation. So let's look at our international human rights treaties that South Africa is uh, a signatory of. So what we did is we went to um, uh, the VAL where uh, CESOL is and where ESCOM is and there are lots of coal-fired power plants and we spoke to people on the ground and we asked them, um, is there a way we can represent you to fight against this plan, and they said yes. And some of the issues they brought up were linked to their human rights. And the most important one was the right to health. So their health was being affected by this air pollution, yet the state didn't have state facilities uh, for them to access for access to healthcare. So what we did is we brought in international human rights law to supplement our arguments about what uh, the state's obligations are. So what we can do is uh, target different points of entry, uh, different points of law, um, and uh, 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 the human rights one is quite a powerful one uh, because it's quite extensive in how it relates to obligations outside of uh, human rights like your, your, climate, uh, your climate obligations as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. And Maria? Thank you. And then we'll go uh, to... Yeah, I just want to also elaborate a bit and compliment um, here. I, I think that, yes, we, we and in many countries probably, they sign these conventions, they documents, regional cooperation documents. And, for example, two years ago during the COP, our president went to UK and he promised to everyone uh, that we will reduce our emissions 
uh, by 16%, and then with the international help uh, by 40%, um, just in 10 years' time. So uh, two years now passed, and the convention conventions also, they are signed. But it seemed to me that we were not, as a social movement or environmental movement, we didn't know the methods, instruments, we were not equipped. We didn't know how to use those. And uh, still maybe we are not really aware and not very active in this, but it really depends on our activity also on how we use those instruments that internationally, like international convention, and etc. how we use it and what we can do the, uh, with those obligations and how we can challenge our government and our presidents also, and the ministries, for example, for environment or ministry of health. And this is, of course, the big responsibility and big role, but um, if not us, if not the influencers and activists, then, then who? I mean, and those people, those champions, they also can be in the government, for example. Um, and we are trying to find at least one <laughs> at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. All right, we're now going to turn to Bridget, who's got the unenviable task of summarizing uh, our panel discussion. So good luck, good luck, Bridget. Yeah, it, a lot was covered, and my pens kept giving up, so I had to keep changing pens. Um, I'm going to just draw on a few points that came out from the panelists, and then I'm also going to, I've tried to pull together a few things which came up jointly in more than one, not necessarily in each of them. Um, so Eric is speaking about um, Ecuador and the impact of extraction on Ecuador. She also highlighted capitalism versus more indigenous local solutions. She put forward quite a few uh, possible um, or important things in moving forward the importance of North-South solidarity and partnership, to think outside the capitalist system, and that was, we keep hearing throughout this conference, um, and that health systems need to be built on other world or indigenous views. Uh, that indigenous philosophical way of life, which is respectful of nature and recognizes the environment, is, um, needs to be integrated that hope is not alone, the importance of collective action, and again, that came up quite a lot in others, with other speakers. Um, and she ended off in her initial speaking saying, not rights or promises, but revolution, that this really needs something big. Um, Maria spoke about her, Central Asia and the beauty of the landscape, but also the air pollution and the denialism of air pollution and actions that were required to actually start addressing this. And everything from a silent strike to demanding clean air, monitoring of air quality, providing information and trying to address denialism within government about how serious this, this air pollution, pollution was. Um, and it sounds like there were attempts to delegitimize from government, but they continued until they started making impact and started being heard by government. So uh, I think we all know how difficult it is when your actions are being de delegitimized and the importance of continued action. Um, so what she spoke about was the importance of research, advocacy, information, education, and then again, the actions, the strikes, the, the, you know, as a means to actually get information out. Paul gave across a huge amount of information in a short period of time, and I'm not sure I'm going to do it justice because there was so much there. But um, he spoke of some of the negative effects of uh, the, the crisis that's going on highlighted political, social, and commercial determinants, um, the impacts of burning of fossil fuels. Inequity got spoken about a lot, and especially that the most vulnerable um, are the least responsible. And I think that's something that really needs to be highlighted because we, 
we are often saying we, but there are differences in the actions that are causing the climate crisis and there are differences in the impact. Um, he spoke about how to go about actually challenging some of what is going on. From disruptive action, using information, again, hope came up that we need the hope to make a change, that policy reforms are needed, and we need to develop a poly uh, positive vision, so we're moving towards something. Um, Alexa spoke about the anti-extractive movement and the grassroots movement in, in Greece in particular, in the area that he lives, Thessalonica, and the impact of the climate crisis. Um, he spoke about local community action and how that got subverted through political interference, ultimately, um, by, by the government that also then allowed space for the extractive companies to enter into the dialogue and influence policy, negatively affecting the, the movement as it was on the ground. Um, he raised a question about how to keep independent, how to keep um, the independence of movements. Um, then again, he spoke about from the political interference, the in intimidation and oppression of local activists. Also, again, spoke about the need for international cooperation. Um, and that we need to see the struggle for the other society needs to address the needs of the people of the world and not the multinationals. He spoke quite strongly throughout his talk about power relations. Imbali uh, spoke about a very successful movement, the Treatment Action Campaign, and various aspects of um, that were used by the Treatment Action Campaign as a means to address HIV treatment in South Africa. So spoke about community importance, the, um, the importance of people's power, the rights-based approach that the Treatment Action Campaign took, um, and in order to see social, political, economic, and environmental transition. So part of the social mobilization, part of the strategy was social mobilization, public awareness and litigation, and constitutional advocacy, and then using various leverage points within a human rights framework to try and affect the changes. And it was a successful. She spoke about the importance of picking a area that is tangible within the struggle and that how in South Africa it was treatment for children that was used as that leverage. Um, then Majuresh spoke about using public health as a strategy for le leverage in the climate justice movement. And I think again throughout the conference and Majuresh highlighted some areas where information sharing about the public health impact of climate change is being shared in order to make the case that much more stronger about the ultimate crisis to humanity this is. Um, so using a public health lens, it's a great new angle that was spoken about, and using everyday examples to show the impact. Um, from the audience, there were various questions asked or, or, and points put across about legitimizing the private sector through the multi-stakeholderism and the power imbalance that is addressed within that and, and uh, how do you delegitimize them or how, you know, it cannot, it cannot legitimize the private sector and multinationals. Um, also how we need to be conscious how we can, how we are legitimizing wrong actions. For example, the next COP being in Emirates and this, the not so subtle message in that decision. Um, there was also responses about the society of the class struggle and the need to focus on the needs of people. There was a question, a very pertinent question about our false friends or philanthrocapitalism. As Majuresh said, it is a necessary evil, but the importance of exposing information about them, 
and to keep on fighting. Um, Alexis did a great intervention there saying, no, thank you. We don't need your tax evasion. We need your taxes. Um, but that important to inform yourself right up and expose them. There was also input about reclaiming governments and how to reclaim, how do you reclaim governments and make them accountable for their actions. And Mbali gave some examples there. Um, I'm going to just highlight a few of the joint things that have just come. Okay. Um, collective actions. I'm, I'm not doing sentences. I'm just putting across a few points. Collective actions. Um, action, information, advocacy, using media, using policy. The importance of north, south, and solidarity and an international movement as well as local movements, um, challenging power relations, using a human rights framework, the public health lens, um, and I think that Paul's message, if all else fails, disrupt, is a good point to end on. Amazing, let's give Bridget a great clap for that wonderful summary. Now, we just, need to, we just need to conclude. If you want to know more about the kind of political economy of health, please get hold of all the copies of Global Health Watch, one to six. It's like an encyclopedia of the political economy of health and activism. And also join the People's Health Movement in Cali, in Colombia, this December. Um, Pablo Cassels, the composer, once said, the situation is hopeless, we must take the next step. And I think that's what I've heard everybody saying. And Nelson Mandela said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Again, a powerful message which he envisaged of imagining um, an, a, a post-apartheid South Africa, so we have to imagine a post-fossil fuels world. And then Barack uh, Obama said, the best way not to feel hopeless is to get up and do something. If you go out and make some good things happen, if you fill the world with hope, you will fill yourself with hope. So I think the other message is that we have to do that filling with hope together, collectively, not as individuals. So I think I'd like to thank PMAC for giving us the forum, for allowing so many diverse Diverse, diverse voices to come and can you give a big big hand clip to our wonderful panel and thank them all <laughs> and also um, can we can we cross to Alexis again is it possible yes I know but they're not seeing it hold it again Alexis hold it up again there we go thank you Alexis Global Health Watch okay lunchtime everybody <laughs>